the great Brahma gods from each of the five pure abodes brought the news to all beings that a hundred thousand years from now a perfectly enlightened Buddha would arise in the world. Those who wish to meet up with him must maintain the five moral precepts and constantly develop loving kindness. Humans and deities wondered who the future Buddha might be, but no answer was forthcoming until a sign appeared, making the identity of the heavenly Bodhisattva known. The deities and Brahmas met together for the sake of inquiring who the enlightened one would be. At that very moment, the answer became clear as they all saw the five preliminary signs appearing in Santusita Devaputa. The five signs which appeared were withering of the decorative celestial flowers on his body, the divine raiment becoming discolored, sweat dripping from his armpits, his complexion becoming mottled, and a feeling of weariness with the heavenly world arising within him. Upon recognizing the five preliminary signs, the deities invited Santusita, the Buddha-to-be, to depart from Dusita heaven and take birth in the human world. Santusita Devaputa then made the five-fold survey of the earth to see if conditions were right for his birth. The first criterion was that the lifespan for human beings at the time must not be too short nor too long, suitable for attaining the Dhamma. The continent must be India and the country the middle country. He must be born either into the warrior caste or as a Brahmin and his mother must be one pure in moral conduct with much accumulated spiritual virtue. Seeing that all of these conditions were fulfilled, the Buddha-to-be accepted the invitation to be born upon the earth. How do you 
Royal astrologers interpret the Queen's dream. Your wife, the Queen's dream, indicates that you are to have a son. He will possess tremendous merit, great power and might. He will be peerless. Tradition calls for me to return to my family home at Dewataha to give birth. You have my permission. Stop and rest here. We have now completed half of our journey. The forest park of Lumpini is so beautiful and shady. We've been traveling half the day. You must all be tired. Let's rest for a while. Your Highness, if that is your wish, then please rest beneath that solid tree over there. to give birth. Quickly, join in and help. Her Majesty's time has come. Hurry, hurry! the Bodhisatta was delivered from his mother's womb, and before he could drop to the ground, four great Brahma gods from the five pure abodes spread a net of gold to receive his body. On that day, the full moon of the sixth month, the year of the Buddha's birth, equivalent to 623 BC. I am supreme in the world foremost in the world, most excellent in the world. This is my last birth. There will be no more birth for me.
I have heard the good news of your son's birth and have come to pay a visit. Venerable Lysita, I thank you very much. And as you have been respected by the Sakian royal family for a long time now, would you be so kind as to examine my child's physical characteristics the whole family gathered here would be able to hear? Your Majesty, please place your child in the cradle first, so that I can see him well. This royal child exhibits all the characteristics of a great being laid down in the ancient texts. I have never seen any being with the signs expressed to such perfection. Huh? Venerable Asita! I have examined the characteristics of your newborn son. I predict that when your son has grown up, should he lead the household life, he will become a wheel-turning monarch, a great king of the world. But if he should leave, he will become a fully enlightened Buddha, supreme teacher of gods and humans. Oh, but it's such a pity. What's such a pity, Venerable Asita? It's a pity that I am too old to have the chance to live to see this great being grow up. In the future, my son will be a great being with more power and might than any other in the world. From the 108 Brahmins I invited for the naming ceremony, you eight have been selected to interpret my baby son's characteristics. You are all proficient. Please give your prediction for my son's future life. Majesty, having examined your son's characteristics, I predict that. Should he inherit your throne, he will become a great wheel-turning monarch with an empire that spreads far in every direction. But should he go forth as a monk, he'll become the perfectly enlightened Buddha, the unequaled supreme teacher and guide to the world. Venerable Kundanya, you are the last of the eight Brahmins. Do you agree with the other seven Brahmins that my son has two courses, either to become a great wheel-turning monarch or to become a fully enlightened Buddha? I have considered your son's characteristics in detail. and can see only one path for him. He will certainly not live as a householder, but will go forth as a monk. Then he will become enlightened as the Lord Buddha. This is beyond doubt, Your Majesty. You predict my son will reject the household life 
What would cause him to make such a decision? Your son will see four signs. An old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a monk. These signs will inspire him to give up the royal throne for the sake of the holy life through which he will become enlightened as the Buddha. Well, I would like my son to be a great wheel-turning monarch, ruling the four great continents, the greatest prestige for any king. From this point onwards, I will not allow my son to ever see an old, sick, or dead man, or a monk. Having predicted the prince's future life, the eight Brahmins gave him the auspicious name Siddhatha, meaning he who will succeed in that which he desires. Having returned to their homes, each of the Brahmins instructed their sons that when the time comes for the new prince to leave the household life, they should go forth and follow him. Seven days after Prince Siddhartha's birth, his mother, Queen Siri Mahamaya, passed away and became a god in the heaven of Tusida. So King Sudodana had Queen Suri Mahamaya's younger sister, Maha Pachapati, raise Prince Siddhartha. Later, the king took Maha Pachapati as his new queen. King Sudodana and Queen Maha Pachapati had a son and a daughter together. But the queen still loved and cared for Prince Siddhartha as if he were her own son. Both of you would like to go and watch a plowing ceremony, wouldn't you? Today my father has had the city decorated in preparation for a great ceremony. It only takes place once a year. Go and watch. I will simply sit here. You needn't worry about me. With your permission, we'll go and watch for a while. As soon as the ceremony is finished, we'll be right back, your highness. Left alone in a peaceful and shady glade, Prince Siddhartha began to sit in meditation, attaining the tranquility of the first jhana. As the afternoon passed by, the shadows of all the trees moved with the course of the sun, except for the shade of the rose apple tree under which the prince sat. It did not shift position. But remained steadily in place. When the companions returned and saw this wonder, they were startled and conveyed the news to the king, who went to see for himself. When my son was newly born, a Sita the hermit came to look at him and to my surprise he bowed at my son's feet. On that day, I also bowed to my son for the first time. Now, my son has performed this marvel. Having seen it, I feel I must bow to him for a second time. When Prince Siddhartha was seven years old, King Sudodana had three ponds dug in the grounds of the palace so that the prince could enjoy himself playing with his friend. 
Upon seeing that the prince had grown sufficiently to begin his education, King Sudodana sent him to study with the renowned teacher Visa Vamita. Prince Siddhartha trained in 18 arts and sciences until he was adept. He was his teacher's top student. And before too long, he had learned all that his master could teach. When Prince Siddhartha reached the age of 16, King Sudodana had three palaces built for his son. One in which to reside during the hot season, one for the rainy season, and one for the cold season. The king, wishing to prevent his son from leaving the household life, consulted with his ministers and obtained the hand of Princess Yasodhara for him in marriage. Time passed by until Prince Siddhartha reached the age of 29 years. Siddhartha, there is nothing worth seeing outside of the royal palace. Since I was a child, I have not once set foot outside the great walls of this palace. I'd like to see what's outside. There's no place out there as beautiful or pleasant as right here inside our royal palace. That may be true, but I'd still like to go and see for myself. Please give me permission to go outside, Father. <sighs> well, if you really want to, I won't frustrate you, my son. I'll have a royal chariot prepared. Tomorrow morning, you may go outside. Thank you very much, Father. This is what it's like outside the palace. Why did my father say there's nothing worth seeing and wish for me not to go out? Stop the chariot. What is it, Your Highness? Look at that man over there. Why is his skin so wrinkled? And why is he having trouble walking? Oh, that's an old man, Your Highness. An old man? Everyone who lives for long enough will come to be like that man, Your Highness. Everyone must come to a state like that?
Chana. Stop the chariot. What is it, Your Highness? Why is that man sitting and shivering over there? He is sick, Your Highness. He is sick? Sickness is a natural part of life. We must all experience sickness, every one of us. Your Highness, Your Highness, where are you going? Your Highness, please come back. Please get back on the chariot, Your Highness. There's a man wrapped in that cloth, isn't there? Your Highness, that's a dead man. And must we all die? Yes, Your Highness. There isn't anyone that can escape death. Even me? Uh, yes, Your Highness. Even you are subject to death. Chana, stop the chariot. That is a monk, Your Highness. Oh, so calm and peaceful, composed and restrained, truly inspiring. Your Highness, your wife has just given birth to a son. My dear child, I've just begun seeking for a path beyond suffering. I know you are born like a snare from my heart. I will give you the name Rahula, which means better.
Yasodara, you are as dear to me as my own heart, Rahula. You are everything to me. But not one of us can escape old age, sickness, and death. I must find a way for all of us to go beyond suffering, no matter how much trouble or turmoil there is in the search. Kantaka. Don't let anybody see you. Meet me in front of the palace gate. Hurry! Yes, Your Highness. At the moment that Prince Siddhartha was leaving the palace gate, Vasavati Mara the great deceiver manifested. He was now worried that he could not use the prince's enjoyment of sensual pleasures to keep him under his control. Ha 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 Prince! Better go back into the royal palace. In there everything is lovely, pleasant and comfortable. In just seven days, you'll become a great wheel-turning monarch. Don't give all of this up. If you leave, you'll get nothing but trouble, torment, suffering, and sorrow. I don't want to become a great wheel-turning monarch. I don't wish for possessions or comfort and happiness because such things are not likely to free me from suffering, nor are they likely to help me assist my loved ones and my subjects. Step aside and allow me to pass. Do you think you can escape from my power? I'll be here waiting for you, you see? For a chance to overwhelm you with greed, hatred, and delusion. I'll follow you like your shadow. Let's see who will win this battle. We've reached the river Anoma. Stop right here, Chana. If I'm to attain to the supreme enlightened knowledge, may these strands of hair float away into the air. But if I'm not to succeed, may they fall to the ground right here. When the prince threw his hair up into the air, it floated into the sky and didn't fall down. Indra, the king of the gods, caught it in a crystal casket which he then enshrined in the Kulamani Shrine in the Tavatimsa heaven. 
the Brahma Gatikara offered the prince the eight requisites of a Samana and received in their place the prince's raiment, which he installed in the Dusa shrine in the Brahma world. Don't be sad and upset, Chana. I'm doing this in order to seek the way out of suffering for all beings. You must go back and inform my father that I will not return to the royal palace until I have attained direct knowledge of the end of suffering. The horse Kantaka was so grieved to be parted from Prince Siddhartha that his heart gave out and he died right there. The power of his appreciation and gratitude to his master carried him to Tavatinza heaven where he was reborn as a god. Having left Jana behind, the Renunzian prince walked on to a mango grove, where he stopped and resided, eating no food for a period of seven days. On the eighth day, the Renunzian prince left the mango grove to go for alms in the city of Rajagaha. All the townspeople could see that this monk was different from other renunciants because of his radiant complexion and an effably calm demeanor. The people spoke to one another, praising the monk's splendor, saying that it was as if a god had descended from heaven for humans to see. Once the renunciant had received a suitable amount of alms food, he returned to his place of rest. Sitting, the prince contemplated the motley food offerings within his alms bowl, all mixed together it was an unappetizing sight. In the past, I would partake of only the most refined and delicious foods. Now leading the holy life for the sake of seeking truth, can there be any point in being fussy over what I eat? This nourishment is merely a necessity for sustaining life. King Bimbisara of Rajagaha sent his men on the trail of this Samana, whom the townspeople regarded as splendid, like a god. He then went to see the Renunciant Prince for himself. When King Bimbisara saw the dignified, peaceful demeanor of the young monk, he felt greatly inspired. Then, exchanging conversation with the Samana, the delight in his heart increased all the more. Due to his suspicion that Prince Siddhartha had left the palace due to a dispute with his relatives over the throne, King Bimbisara offered the throne of Rajagaha to the prince. But the prince refused the king's offer, having renounced his own throne, not due to a dispute, but in order to seek the way beyond suffering. With such firm intention, I'm sure you'll attain the supreme enlightenment. Once you have done so, 
May I request that you come and teach the Dharma to myself and to the citizens of Rajagaha. The Renunciant Prince traveled on to the hermitage of Alara Kalama in order to study and practice under him. In a short time, he had learned all that his master could teach, and so then he traveled on to seek Udaka Ramaputa at his hermitage. Before long, he had come to the end of this teacher's knowledge too. When he asked about attainments beyond that which he had already been taught, Udaka Ramaputa could offer no reply, but instead offered him the leadership of the community. But when the Bodhisattva saw that what he had learned was not the way out of suffering he was seeking, he took his leave and moved on in order to continue his search for higher truth. The Bodhisattva came to Uruvela at Senanigama and considered the fresh coolness of its shady forest with orderly rows of trees and a river running through located nearby to the village. It seemed a suitable place for him to continue striving for liberation, so he ceased his traveling and settled in that spot. The Brahmin Gondanya was very pleased to hear the news that Prince Siddhartha had gone forth and hurried to seek out the sons of each of the seven other Brahmins with whom he had divined the identity of the Bodhisattva according to his physical characteristics when he was just born. He managed to gather and persuade only four of these sons and then together the five Brahmins left the household life and set off in search of the great renunciant. The five Brahmins now gone forth were Gondanya, Vapa, Badia, Mahanama, and Asaji. This group of five together were known as the Pankavagya. The Pankavagya followed after the Bodhisattva through various places until they found him practicing ardently in the place where he had settled. They settled there with him, attending to his needs, with the hope that when he attained enlightenment, he would teach the Dhamma to them. The Renuncian Prince was intent on seeking the path to enlightenment. So he took up three of the extreme ascetic practices that were favored by the practitioners of those days. For the first period, he pressed his teeth against his teeth and his tongue against his palate, so firmly that sweat ran from his whole body. The pain was as severe as if someone were gripping his throat tightly, strangling him. When he saw that this was not the way to enlightenment, he gave up on the practice and changed to another method. For the second period, he restricted his in and out breaths, stifling them until both his ears rung loudly, his head ached and his stomach racked with pain, his body as if on fire. But no matter how great the distress, he did not give up his efforts until he saw that this was not the way to enlightenment. Seeing this, he gave up the practice and changed to another method. For the third period, he fasted until he was emaciated, wrinkled, his complexion discolored, his bones and sinews extruding. Exhausted of energy and suffering greatly, rubbing his hand over his body, the hairs stuck to his palm. I've 
carried out the extreme ascetic practices, pushing the body to limits which no other could exceed. Why have I not yet attained enlightenment? Or perhaps this path is not the way to liberation. The Bodhisattva is worrying and wondering about the path to realization. What's the best way to help him? Aha! This is the way. that lute is too tight. A little pluck and it snaps. One string is too loose. When plucked, the sound is barely heard. One string is just right. Not too loose, not too tight. When plucked, the sound resonates far and wide, sweetly. Oh, it is the practice of the middle way that leads to enlightened knowledge. But the current state of my body surely can't support efforts in developing the mind along the middle path of practice. Prince Siddhartha whom we had held in esteem as a bodhisattva, bound for success, even after practicing strictly for six years, using all his effort, is still unable to achieve enlightenment. Now he's relaxed his efforts. Ah, and eating proper food again. How will he ever succeed? Quite so, venerable Kondanya, you're the most senior amongst us. What do you think we should do? Under the circumstances, there can be no use in attending to him any longer. The time has come for us to take our leave. <laughs> On the night of the 14th waxing moon of the sixth lunar month, as dawn was approaching, and the Bodhisatta, close to waking, five auspicious signs appeared in his dreams. Which he interpreted as follows. One, he would achieve enlightenment as the Buddha. Two, he would declare the true Dhamma for the benefit of all humans and deities. Three, a great number of people would come to train under him, thus establishing the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Four, people of all castes and classes after training under him would come to understand the same pure Dhamma. Five, people from all over the world would bring offerings to him to express their faith and trust. But his heart would remain unstained by even the slightest attachment to such wealth. In the village of Uruvela Senanigama, there lived a wealthy man's daughter named Suchata. When she was young, she made a vow to the deity abiding in a banyan tree close by, so that she might have a husband of equal wealth and birth, and that her first child might be a son. 
Once her wishes had been fulfilled, she prepared a rice dish, prepared with cow's milk and honey, as an offering to honor the tree deity. Madam Suchada! Madam Suchada! What's the matter, Puna? Why are you rushing in such an excited way? It seems that the tree god has come to receive your offering. I saw him at the banyan tree over there with my own eyes. He's glowing with a beautiful halo all around him. Ah, everyone, quickly help! Puna, go and fetch a golden tray for the honeyed milk rice. We'll take it out to offer to the tree god. Quickly, go, go! All of my wishes have been so graciously granted. Please, may I offer this meal of honeyed milk rice and this golden tray to you. I offer this prayer. If I am to succeed in realizing perfectly enlightened knowledge, may this golden tray float up the river against the current. But if I am not to achieve my goal, may this tray float downstream with the current. I'm a Brahmin called Sotiyasa. I'm inspired with great faith at the sight of you. Please let me show my respect. May I offer you eight handfuls of blade grass? For as long as I have not yet attained to supreme enlightened knowledge, even if my blood and flesh should dry up with only skin, bone, and sinews remaining, I shall not rise from this seat.
been following Prince Siddhartha's every step, so as to stop him from achieving enlightenment. If I let him go ahead with this, he'll slip out of my grasp for sure. I must cut him off now. I must destroy him. Ha 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 ha. power of the Bodhisattva's spiritual qualities and goodness, accumulated over countless lifetimes, protected him as though in invisible armor, his heart steady and peaceful, unshaken by fear. cannot harm the prince. I must make use of a ruse to deceive him. Prince Siddhartha, the seat you sit on came to be because of my own spiritual powers. My troops are my witnesses. You must get up at once. Pay attention, King of Deceivers. This seat comes to me as the fruit of my good actions accumulated through all of my efforts in the past. <laughs> then who will bear witness to your ownership of this seat? I will bear witness. <laughs> Darani, goddess of the earth! All the merit made by his good actions in the past, even the water which he has poured on the ground in dedication of merit, soaked up by my hair and kept close to my head, is sufficient to bear witness to his virtues. After his victory over Mara and his host of deceivers, the Bodhisattva's mind was firm, focused, and concentrated. At dusk, the Bodhisattva began to develop meditative insight, attaining to the first knowledge, Pubenivasa Nusatinyana, the ability to recollect his past lives. In the silence of the late night, he attained the second knowledge, Kutu Papa Tanyana, knowledge of the passing away and rebirth of beings according to the results of their actions. Close to dawn, the Bodhisattva attained to the third knowledge, Asavaka Yanana, knowledge of the destruction of mental defilements, complete liberation and freedom from suffering. He thus came to be the fully 
self-awakened Buddha. Now you are revealed, and your power redundant. After the Bodhisatta had attained to the Dhamma and become the Buddha, he sat under the Maha Bodhi tree, enjoying the bliss of freedom for seven days. Then he went and stood in the open, gazing back at the Maha Bodhi tree and recollecting its virtues. He stood there and gazed without blinking for seven days. After that, the new Buddha walked back and forth between the Maha Bodhi tree and the place where he had stood for another seven days. Having walked meditation for seven days, for the fourth week, he sat meditation in a crystal shelter prepared for him by heavenly beings. He sat and contemplated the most profound Dhamma for seven days. Raka, Ardi, that's the recluse Gotama who attained the Dhamma. That's right, Sister Tanha. That's him for sure. Our father, Lord Mara, together with all his troops, could not defeat this one and was humiliated. It's up to us to find a way to take revenge. Tanha, Raka, in this world, I've never met a man whose heart could resist the three of us. We who embody infatuation and desire. Artie, you're right. We will use our femininity to ensnare the recluse Gotama in the bonds of sensuality and entangle him for countless time. <laughs> Daughters of Mara, go back. There is no way you can succeed in what you are trying to do. For I have utterly destroyed all kinds of satisfaction and infatuation. My name is Tanha and this is Rakan Orti. We're not here to tease or deceive you, but the truth is, we are quite taken with the sight of you. 
Really and truly, sir, no one, no one has ever made us feel so enamored as you. No one, sir. That's right. The three of us offer our bodies and our hearts to your service, expecting no reward. Our wish is simply that you find satisfaction in us, even if only for a short time. That would make us so very happy. I've told you already. I have utterly destroyed all kinds of satisfaction and infatuation. You will not find what you are looking for. There is nothing for you here. You should go away. Nakotama, the Enlightened One. sat enjoying the bliss of freedom underneath the Mukalinga tree. As he sat, the rain fell constantly. A king of Nagas called Mukalinga, saw him and was inspired with faith. He coiled his body around the Buddha, then opened his hood over the Blessed One's head to protect him from the wind and rain. subsided, he uncoiled from the Buddha and changed his body into the form of a young man, bowing and paying respects to the Buddha. I, Naga King Muchalinda, am the Buddha's servant. I pay homage to the Blessed One. Silence is happiness for the one who has seen the Dharma. Delight in the peace of seclusion, harmlessness to all beings, freedom from lust and overcoming sensuality. These are the highest joys in the world. The eradication of conceit is the greatest happiness of all. In the seventh week after his enlightenment, the Buddha sat and enjoyed the bliss of freedom under the tree called Rajayatana for another seven days. You 
have enjoyed the bliss of freedom for seven weeks without taking any food to eat. Please accept this medicinal fruit I have brought for you from the heavenly world. Those two merchant brothers made merit with me in the past. I should take this opportunity to help them meet the Buddha. Look, Tapusa, all of our carts have stopped as if fixed to the ground. No matter how much our men work the bullocks to make them pull, the cart still won't budge. They just won't move. It's strange. Uh, why would the... Huh? You two merchants, do you know that the just now enlightened, perfectly awakened Buddha is now sitting under the Rajyatana tree over there? You'd better go and pay your respects to him, then offer him the baked and ground grain meal you're carrying with you. It will be a cause for your benefit and happiness for a long time. Your two humble servants bring baked and ground grain meal to offer. Please may the Lord Buddha accept our offering. I lost my alms bowl before my enlightenment. When I accepted the honeyed milk rice from Sujata, I floated the golden tray off in the stream. Now these two merchants are offering me a meal. A recluse should not have more than one alms bowl. We, Tapusa and Balika, declare ourselves to be lay Buddhists. We take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma for the rest of our lives. Your two humble servants, Balika and Tapusa, would like to ask you for some object that we may keep to honour and revere. I have attained the Dharma, which is profound and subtle. It is difficult for ordinary people to understand and practice. There are several kinds of people in this world. The quick-witted, upon hearing my teachings, know and understand them quickly, just like a lotus flower above the surface of the water that blossoms as soon as it receives the sun's rays. Those of moderate intelligence, having heard my teachings and then receiving some further explanation and training, are able to know and understand within a short time, just like a lotus flower level with the surface of the water ready to blossom the next day. The slow-witted, 
having heard the teachings, receiving further explanation and training, persevering with faith, are able to know and understand in the end, like a lotus flower below the water, which grows upwards before finally breaking through the surface and blossoming. The final kind of person, no matter how many times they hear the Dhamma, are unlikely to grasp the meaning or understand, although their listening may be a cause for realization in a future existence. This type may be compared to a lotus down in the muck and mire, falling prey to fish and turtles, not rising up and blossoming. This being the case, I'll preserve my life for the sake of spreading the Dhamma. I will teach humankind until the Dhamma becomes firmly established and widespread for the benefit and happiness of all for a long time. It's a pity that Alara the Hermit passed away seven days ago, and Udaka the Hermit passed away just yesterday. If Alara Galama could have lived for another seven days, and Udaka Ramaputta just one more day, they would both have surely attained enlightenment. The Buddha had known through superhuman knowledge of the passing away of Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta. Then he remembered the Pankavagya, the five monks who had attended him while he was practicing extreme asceticism. Each of the five had well-developed faculties. If they could hear the teaching, they would surely soon attain to the Dhamma. That's Gautama, the recluse, the one to whom we formerly attended. So it is. The one who gave up his austerities. All right. If he comes here, we won't bother to get up and welcome him. We'll just put out a seat. If he wants to sit down, then let him sit. so glad to meet with him again that we've forgotten our agreement to show no interest. Even I, myself, forgot it completely. Recluse Gautama, what leads you to visit us here in this forest? Do not address me in that way. I have now Attain to the Dharma. Pay attention to my words. If you follow my instructions before very long, you will realize the Dharma. While practicing austerities for a long time, you did not become enlightened. So how could you? How could you have attained liberation after giving up your efforts and causing us to abandon you? Throughout all of that time, did I ever say anything like this to you all? No, it's true. You have never said anything like this to us before. Entangling oneself in sensual indulgence, tormenting one's body with hardship and pain, these are ways a renunciant should not undertake. 
for they stray from the path of enlightenment. The middle way, that is the noble eightfold path, is the practice that leads to Nibbana. There are four noble truths as follows. Suffering, disease of the body, disease of the mind, should be understood. Craving, which is the cause of suffering, should be abandoned. Cessation of suffering should be realized. The path of practice leading to the cessation of suffering should be developed. Once the Buddha had given his first Dhamma teaching, the Venerable Gondanya gained the vision of Dhamma and thus became the first stream enterer. Anya Kondanya, Anya Kondanya, Kondanya knows the truth. Lord Buddha, please grant me ordination as a Buddhist monk. You are now a bhikkhu. Well taught is the Dharma. Practice the holy life and put an end to suffering. The Buddha gave ordination to Venerable Vapa on the first day of the waning moon, Venerable Badiya on the second day, Venerable Mahanama on the third, and Venerable Asati on the fourth. On the fifth day of the waning moon of the eighth lunar month, the Buddha gave the teaching known as the Anathalakana Sutta. The five groups that we take as a self are as follows. Body, feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Perception and memory. Mental formations. Sense consciousness, awareness of mental impressions. These five aggregates are not me, not him or her, not mine, not his or hers, not myself not his or herself. All these things are impermanent and insubstantial. It is their nature to arise, persist for a while, and then pass away. After listening to the teaching, each of the Pankavagya attained to Arahantship. Actually, these women are not so attractive at all. My father built me three mansions, one for each season of the year. He hired beautiful maidens to play music and entertain me. I thought I was living a happy life, but now I feel tired of this way of life. Is this all I came into this world for? Are these the only things that can give one happiness in life? Then. Why do I feel so bored and fed up? How troubled I feel. How frustrated. How troubled I feel. 
How frustrated. It is not troubling here. It is not frustrating. Come this way, Yasa, and I will teach you the Dharma. Dana or giving, means training one's heart to know generosity, to know sacrifice. Silla, or morality, means establishing one's heart within the full doctrine of goodness. Heaven is the reward for a wholesome heart. The harm of sense pleasures is the heat and worry that comes with attachment to the sense of a self. The benefit of renunciation is that present suffering can be abandoned, with no other suffering taking its place. After the gradual teaching, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths. Once he had given this teaching, Yasa attained to the fruition of stream entry. are my son Yasa's shoes. Wait here, all of you. I'll go after him myself. Here comes the father. If he meets with his son now, it may prevent him from realizing the Dharma. You, sitting there, have you seen a young man named Yasa? He's my son. Please take a seat first, and I will teach you the Dharma. And after that, you will meet with your son. Then the Buddha gave the same Dhamma teachings that he had given to Yasa. has helped gain the vision of Dharma. I declare myself a Buddhist and take the Triple Gem as my refuge for the rest of my life. Yasa, hurry back home. Your mother doesn't stop crying. Out of worry for you. Let's go back now, my, my son. Yasa has now heard my Dharma teaching twice and has fully penetrated it. He is now an Arahant, with no thoughts of returning to the household life. Yasa, now you've gained what is truly supreme. Please, may I invite the Lord Buddha to receive alms food at my house this morning. Once the wealthy man had left, Yasa requested ordination as a bhikkhu. Once Yasa's mother and wife heard the Buddha's teachings, they both gained the vision of Dhamma, attaining the fruition of stream entry. They declared themselves as Buddhists and took refuge in the Triple Gem, becoming the first female followers of Buddhism. Vimala, Subahu, Punaji, and Gavampati, you were my close friends during the time when I was a layman. Now I've gone forth and do not concern myself with worldly pursuits. For what reasons are you all here? We heard you'd gone forth and were sure you must have had good reasons to do so. 
And so we came to see you. Well, if that's the case, I will take you to meet the Lord Buddha, the one who has shown me the light. I will request the Lord Buddha to give you instructions as well. Follow me. Listen, all of you. Once you know the unwholesome and the roots of the unwholesome, know the wholesome and its roots. Know decay and death as well as their causes. Know the cessation of decay and death. The path leading to the cessation of decay and death. Once you know suffering and its causes, the cessation of suffering, know the path leading to the cessation of suffering, then you can be said to have the right view. The 50 of you are all friends from my home region. If you need help with something, I will do whatever I can to help you. When we heard that you had ordained as a monk, we felt inspired, and it made us want to ordain as well. Very good. I will take you to meet the Lord Buddha, but you must make the request for ordination yourselves. Listen, all of you. A bhikkhu in this Dhamma Vinaya is taught not to grasp at any state. Hearing this, he understands with wisdom. Understanding with wisdom, he attends to knowing all states as they arise, knowing feelings as they arise, pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, neither pleasant nor unpleasant feelings. He considers the impermanent nature of feelings. He observes the arising, persistence, and passing away of feelings. Seeing impermanence, he grows weary of feelings, weary and disinterested. He is able to let go. Meditating on letting go, not grasping or clinging to feelings, leads him to contemplation and realization of cessation. Bhikkhus, you have now attained the sublime Dhamma. So go forth and travel from place to place, spreading the Dhamma. Proclaim Buddhism for the benefit of the many, but let no two travel on the same route. As for myself, I will go to Uruwela Sananigama to spread the teachings there. Because of that one courtesan, the 30 of us have had to go through all this trouble, forcing our way through the forest into this cotton plantation. That's right. She stole our clothes and our jewelry. We catch up with her then. Whoa, 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 wait. Look, there's an ascetic sitting under that tree over there. Let's ask him if he saw her pass by. Ascetic, sir, did you see a courtesan dressed in green pass by here? Please, sir. She took off with our clothing and our jewelry. So now we're searching for her, but we can't seem to find her. Oh, Bhadavagya, is it better for you to seek for this woman or to seek for yourselves? Uh, I guess it would be better to seek for ourselves. In that case, I will teach you the Dharma. The wise person rids himself of infatuation and preoccupation with the five sensual pleasures. He sees that life is short, and to be distracted by such pleasures is like being snagged and bound up, just as a fish is caught by a hook 
having taken the bait, it's a cause for much suffering and struggle thereafter. Badavagya, you have now all been ordained as Buddhist monks. So go forth and proclaim Buddhism by spreading the Dhamma for the benefit and happiness of all. Ascetic, sir, why are you coming into my hermitage? Venerable Uruvela Kasapa, I've come to ask permission to stay here. Here we practice fire worship, but this ascetic is not one of our kind. What does he want? I'm sorry, sir, I have no accommodation for you here. Please look elsewhere. But I would suggest that you travel in a different direction from this. This bank of the Naranya Jara is occupied by we three Jatila brothers. My name is Uruvela Kasapa. The surrounding area belongs to myself and my 500 followers. Further on down the river is the hermitage of my younger brother, Nadi Kasapa, and his 300 followers. The area beyond that is occupied by Gaya Kasapa, my youngest brother, with his 200 followers. These three riverside hermitages are full. There's no room for you to stay. But I can see a place which is available. Where, ascetic? In your fire-worshipping shrine. Please, give me permission for me to stay there. Ascetic, I don't mind if you stay in there. But I must warn you that there is a fierce and strongly poisonous serpent king in there. If you spend the night in there, your life will be in great danger. Uruvela Kasapa, please give me permission to stay. The Serpent King will do me no harm. If you say so, please make yourself comfortable in the fire worshipping house. must 
have been burned up by the fire of the Serpent King. Despite his power, he's still not yet an Arahant like me. This ascetic is indeed of great might. The gods of every heaven realm take turns to come each night to hear his teachings. But despite his power, he is still not yet an Arahant as I am. There's been a tumultuous rain, and it has flooded the whole area. Surely the ascetic has been washed away or drowned. Master, sir! Master, look over there! This is Caesar. Has so much power. Huh. But despite all of this, he's still not yet an Arahant as I am. This fire worshipper is so proud and conceited. He insists he's an Arahant. How stubborn he is. Uruela Kasapa, your way of practice does not lead you to the path and fruit. So why do you consider yourself an Arahant? Having deceived yourself, you deceive others. If you could give up your pride and practice according to my teachings, in no long time, you would truly be an Arahant. Oh, I realize my fault. Please may the Buddha allow me to take ordination and teach me the Dharma. You are the master of a great hermitage with many followers. You should make this known to all of them. and fire worshipping implements you must have washed down the river from where my two elder brothers live something must have happened to them brother Urvela brother Nati
Oh, Gaia, your two elder brothers have found the right way of the Dharma. Quickly bring your 200 followers to approach the Buddha, the one who illuminates the path. O oh, Bhikkhus, all things are burning. Contact with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind are burning. Feelings, mental formations, and consciousness, whether pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful, are burning. Burning with lust, hatred, and delusion. Burning with birth, aging, and death. Burning with sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. The well-taught noble disciple, seeing this, becomes weary of thoughts and feelings. Being weary, he releases his clinging. Releasing his clinging, his heart is freed. The Buddha has come to stay right here. When I was a young prince, I made five wishes. One, may I be crowned king of the Magadha state. Two, may the Buddha come to my land. Three, may I have an audience with the Buddha. Four, may the Buddha teach me the Dhamma. And five, may I realize his teachings. It seems that all of my wishes are about to be fulfilled. Follow me. We're going to seek out the Buddha and ask for his teaching. Dana or giving, has forgiveness as its highest form. If one develops giving along with forgiveness, one becomes gentle and restrained, and one's heart becomes cool. This is because one has to let go of one's attachment to material things and to one's sense of self. And now, all of my wishes have been fulfilled. Oh yes, your teaching fills me with the greatest joy. Please, may I invite the Lord Buddha and all of the bhikkhus to have a meal in my palace tomorrow morning. The Lativana Park where you're staying is far from the city. It is not convenient for the faithful lay people to visit. Please, may I offer the Veluvana Park to you. The Veluvana Park is cool, shady, and very large. Not far from the city, but still quiet and peaceful. Please, give me your permission to build a monastery for you here. This is the Great Velvana Monastery. A solid foundation for Buddhism has now been laid. Since I, Asaji, left the Buddha at the Deer Park in Isipatana in order to go and spread his teachings, I've not met with him at all.
Oh, but Isa, you're not enjoying the play, are you? You seem completely indifferent and uninterested. Ask yourself the same question, Kalita. You seem quite unimpressed yourself. <sighs> Neither the actors nor the viewers will live for more than a hundred years. In no long time we'll all be dead. We're absorbed in watching entertainment. Seeking fun, but for what benefit? Surely it would be better to seek the past beyond all suffering. I've been thinking the same way as you. All right then. Let's seek out a teacher under whom we can live and practice. To which hermitage should we go? Which teacher should we seek out? These days, there are so many sects. But we should choose the school of Master Sangjaya. It's large and respected, with many followers. Located right in the city of Rajagaha. Besides ourselves, we'll have to persuade our followers to go with us. All right, we'll leave tomorrow. The two of us have trained under Master Sang Jaya until he has nothing more to teach us. Quite so. And it's clear that his doctrine does not teach the way to deliverance that we are seeking. If that's so, we have to seek out another hermitage, another master. We have been friends for a long time. It's best if we make the promise that whichever one of us discovers the path out of suffering first, we'll seek out the other and inform him. Agreed? Agreed. This renunciant walks with such inspiring mindfulness and composure. I've never seen any recluse like him before. I must take this opportunity to prepare him a seat and attend to his needs. Then, when he has eaten, I'll politely ask him where he comes from. Venerable Sir, my name is Upatisa, but some people call me Sariputta after my mother's name, Sari. Please, may I be permitted to ask you, where did you ordain? Who is your teacher? Whose teachings or words do you follow? My name is Venerable Asaji. My master is the Lord Buddha from the Sakyan clan. I'm his disciple and follow his teachings. And what exactly did your master teach you? I've just been ordained and thus cannot give you all of the profound teachings but I can give you a brief version. Whatever dharmas arise due to causes, the great teacher explains those causes and the ending of those dharmas. Oh, Upatisa. You repeat to me such short teachings that you heard, and it's enough for me to see the Dharma. Quickly, let's go and persuade Master Sanjaya to seek out Venerable Asaji's teacher. In this world, of which do you think there is more? Intelligent people or foolish people? More, More foolish people, Master. Such being the case, let those intelligent people go to study under Samana Gotama. I'll stay here for the sake of the foolish. Those two friends walking in here together 
are to be my pair of foremost disciples. The one well established in morality develops ever-present awareness of objects as they arise in the mind. Seeing such objects arising and ceasing continually, he begins to grow weary of them. Becoming weary, he lets go of his grasping and clinging. Letting go of grasping and clinging, his heart is released. Having heard the Buddha's teaching, all of the two friends' followers attained arahanship. But Upatisa and Kolita themselves, with their great accumulation of spiritual qualities and wisdom, were disposed to a slower but more profound realization of the Dhamma, and therefore did not yet become fully enlightened. The two of you are now ordained as monks. I give you the names which will be an honor to your mothers as follows, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mogalana. Mogalana. Employ the methods for overcoming drowsiness that I taught you. Mogalana. Feeling, whether pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, is impermanent. It is of the nature to arise and cease. Being impermanent, it makes for suffering. Being impermanent, it is transitory and insubstantial, unreal, anicham, dakham, anatta. Venerable Buddha, sir, I take the view that all things are disagreeable to me. I do not delight in anything. That being the case, you should not delight in your view, should you? Diganaka. Some people have the view that all things are disagreeable to them. Some have the view that all things are agreeable to them. And others have the view that some things are agreeable and some things disagreeable to them. Each of these views are based on grasping and clinging to the notion of a self. Remaining attached, one continues to grasp at feelings as they arise. Whoever should reflect on such feelings as impermanent phenomena, conditionally arising, existing and passing away, will come to grow weary of conditioned phenomena. This weariness leads to the fading of lust. With the fading of lust, comes freedom from attachment. When the heart is freed from attachment, one knows the heart has been freed. Hearing the Buddha's teaching uprights that which was overturned, reveals that which was hidden, shows the way to one who was lost, shines a light in the darkness. I take the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha as refuge for the rest of my life.
Venerable Sariputta was now the Buddha's right-hand disciple, foremost in wisdom. Venerable Moggallana was the Buddha's left-hand disciple, foremost in psychic powers. Both became great supports to the Buddha as he continued to spread his teachings to people far and wide. Venerable Asaji, today has brought such a wonder. Yes, indeed. Many of the Buddha's faithful disciples, hearing that the Lord Buddha was staying at Velvovana Monastery, traveled separately to meet him and pay their respects. This one great meeting was the occasion for four great marvels. Katuranga Sanipata means that four marvels occurred together on the same day. One, on that day, 1,250 disciples of the Buddha came together without having made any prior arrangement. Two, each of those disciples had been ordained by the Buddha himself. Three, each of those disciples was attained to arahanship. Four, the meeting took place on the full moon of the third lunar month, which is named Magha. Today is the day of the Katuranga Sanipata. I'll deliver the Ovada Patimokha to the bhikkhus. To refrain from all evil, to do good to one's utmost, and to purify one's mind. This practice is the fundamental principle of Buddhism. my senior counselor. Ever since I first heard that my son had attained enlightenment and become the Buddha, I've been wishing to meet him. Nine times I've sent a counselor, each time accompanied with a retinue of 999 subjects to invite the Buddha to come to Kapilavatu. Each time, the party of 1,000 has disappeared without a trace. That's 9,000 subjects I've sent and heard nothing in return. Well, Kalodai, since you are my senior counselor and have been close friends with my son since childhood, I must send you with your retinue to seek out the Buddha at Vulavanu Monastery and invite him one more time. Surely you will succeed in this. Yes, your majesty. I will do my best to bring the Lord Buddha back to the city of Kapilavatu. And with your permission, I would also like to request ordination from the Lord Buddha on this occasion. I give you my permission, Counselor Kalodai. Please make your journey as quickly as possible. I'll be waiting to hear news from you. Each of you should diligently train yourselves thus. I will not grasp at the internal sense fields of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. I will not grasp at the external sense fields of form, sound, smell, taste, bodily contact, and mental objects. I will not grasp at contact between the internal and external sense fields. I will not grasp at feelings. I will not cling to the five aggregates of the body. Feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. I will not cling to this world or the next. 
when I cease clinging to all that I've seen, heard, known, felt, sought, and imagined, all feelings of attachment to these will also cease. Listen, all of you. A person's heart may be purified through consistently applied efforts in practice, through wisdom, through dharma, and through morality, not by means of one's class, family, or property. Lord Buddha, summer begins tomorrow. All the farmers have harvested their crops. The path to the city of Kapilavatu is open and suitable for travel. Your father has a strong wish to meet with you and your disciples. Please, out of compassion, travel to the city of Kapilavatu and teach Dharma to your father. Please teach Dharma to your relatives there. I accept your invitation, Kalu Dai. Please inform the bhikkhus so that they can prepare themselves for travel. The road from Rajagaha to Kapilavatu is 60 leagues. The Lord Buddha, along with 20,000 disciples, will travel one league per day. In 60 days, they will arrive at Kapilavatu city. relatives chose this banyan grove to build Nagroda Monastery as an offering to the Buddha. It's been 60 days since Venerable Kaludai sent news of the Buddha's departure from Rajagaha city. My relatives are waiting here to greet him. The Lord Buddha and 20,000 bhikkhus have arrived, Your Highness. His relatives are clinging to the view that the Buddha is junior to them because he is younger in age. They position their young princes in front of themselves so that they won't have to pay their respects. son was newly born, and the seat of the hermit bowed to him. At that time I also paid homage for the first time. Seven years later, during the royal bowing ceremony, my son sat in meditation, and the rose apple tree shaded him throughout the afternoon, its shadow not shifting with the force of the sun. 
Witnessing this, I paid respects to my son for the second time. Now on this occasion, a truly wonderful marvel has appeared. May I take this opportunity to express my veneration for the third time. Unlike ordinary rain, it soaks only those who wish to be soaked by it. For those who wish to remain dry, every drop will roll right off, just like water drops roll off of a lotus tree. My father and relatives. This is not the first time this red rain has fallen upon such an assembly of relations. In the past, when I was born as Vesantara, Pokaravasa also rained down on a congregation of myself and my relatives. Listen, all of you. Whoever upholds morality will have happiness in this world and the next. Whoever upholds morality will be blessed with riches and good fortune. Whoever upholds morality has an unobstructed path to nirvana. Therefore, may you all uphold the purity of morality. Why do you bring shame to me by going around collecting alms of rice and food in this manner? You are of royal lineage, an heir to my throne. Or are you of the opinion that I cannot afford to provide you or your disciples with enough food myself? Father, at the moment of my enlightenment, I departed from the Sakyan royal family lineage and was established in the lineage of awakened Buddhas. My going for alms round is in accordance with the tradition of all Buddhas. The venerable Sangha also practiced this Buddhist convention. Father, please pay attention to this teaching. When a person clings to and indulges in form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and sense consciousness, that person is bound by the snare of Mara and burdened with the whole mass of suffering. When such a person doesn't cling or indulge in these, that person is freed from the snare of Mara and released from the whole mass of suffering. Please, may I invite you and all your disciples to receive alms food in the royal palace tomorrow morning. In the three days since your arrival in the palace, myself and Queen Mahabhajapati have listened to your teaching and developed in the Dharma more and more each day. However, Bimba, 
who was your wife, has not yet emerged from her room to approach you. She has stayed right there the whole time, immersed in misery. I would like to invite you to please go and speak to her, so that she also may benefit from your teaching. Father, I will go to teach Bimba, taking Venerable Mogalana and Venerable Sariputta, my left and right hand disciples, with me. Why have you been so unkind to me? Your wife! When you left for the holy life, you left in silence. Did I do something wrong to make you leave that way? If I did something wrong, then what was the fault of Rahula, born that very day? That you had to leave him bereft of a father? Bimba, don't be so melancholy. What I did was to help you and all beings that you might have a chance to know the way out of suffering. Bimba, we were born in this world for making merit together, as we have for many lifetimes. Now is the time to reflect on those births and lifetimes according to the truth as follows. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I am the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, abide, supported by my karma. Whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. My mother tells me that you have great treasures, you have great wealth. But since ordaining, you have no desire for royal wealth. As your royal successor, I wish to request my inheritance, which is mine by right. External treasures bind one to the round of death and rebirth on the wheel of samsara. Better to give the noble treasure that is, the most excellent internal treasure, instead of worldly wealth. Rahula, I have the most excellent noble treasure to offer you. Sariputta, release Rahula from worldly suffering and bestow him with noble treasure by ordaining him a Samanera. Rahula, from this point on, you are a Samanera Rahula. Oh, when Siddhartha left the palace and sought Buddhahood, I expected that Nanda would remain to inherit the throne. But then the Buddha took Nanda off to ordain. That left only my grandson, Rahula, who might succeed me. Then the Buddha ordained Rahula as well. If I don't do something, soon the whole Sakyan clan may go forth. Uh, 
I must quickly go to the Nigrota Monastery and plead with the Buddha. Please, Lord Buddha. From this point on, should any householder's son wish to ordain, in the Buddha's dispensation, if his parents don't give their consent, please don't give the ordination. Father, I agree to your request. Tomorrow I will leave together with the Venerable Nanda, Samanera Rahula, and the Bhikkhu Sangha for the Veluvana Monastery in the city of Rajagaha. Since you were first ordained, you have not been intent on the practice of Dhamma or the living of the holy life. All your thoughts are of returning to the household life. My heart is constantly yearning for my wife, Jana Pada Kalyani. There's not a moment spent when I don't think of her. Nanda, come with me and I'll show you things that you've never seen before. Those are Apasara goddesses in heaven. What do you think about them? Uh, uh, every one of those Apsara goddesses is beautiful in face and form. I can think of nothing to compare them with. Even my wife, Janapada Kalyani, has not half their beauty. Nanda, can you see that what you thought before to be exceedingly beautiful now pales in comparison to greater beauty. Yes, Lord Buddha, I can see. From this point on, I'll make up my mind to practice the Dharma. I'll live the holy life without letting my heart be obsessed 
with Janapada Kalyani ever again. I've now seen for myself that there are countless goddesses in heaven, many times more beautiful than her. Nothing can ensnare a man's heart more tightly than a woman. Nothing can ensnare a woman's heart more tightly than a man. In truth, love is like a noose which binds one to obsession and infatuation. It brings one to birth and death in the world again and again, dragging one down into a mass of suffering. That's right, Nanda. There is no pleasure equal to the peace that can be found within one's own heart. For as long as humans rush around seeking external distractions, they will never meet with genuine happiness. Nanda, when you release your clinging and view the whole world as empty, your heart will be free, open, expansive, radiant and joyful. Uttara, why did you send someone to ask for such a large sum of money from your father? I am your husband. I would have given it to you myself. There was no need to bother your father. Dear husband, since our marriage, I have had little opportunity to make merit. I wanted the money to buy food to offer to the Lord Buddha and his disciples. I asked my father for the money because he shares my faith in the Lord Buddha. It's not, you see, that I have no wish to accept your money, good husband. In that case, let it be as you wish. My intention is to prepare the food myself and invite the Lord Buddha and his disciples to receive food in our house for 15 days. In that case, let it be as you wish. And I am afraid that during that time, I will be unable to perform all my wifely duties. In that case, let it be as you wish. I've heard that here in Rajdhir, there is a courtesan called Sirima, whose beauty is renowned throughout the city. Although few men get to enjoy her charms because her fee is so high. For these 15 days, I'm going to hire Sirima to take my place as your wife. Uh, uh, in that case, um, uh, uh, let it be um, as you wish. Exhausted. Oh, dear husband, uh, Miss Sirima. Look at her. Instead of letting others do the work, she's doing it all herself. Her face is dirty, her clothes are all soiled. She should be relaxing in a way fitting of her station, and instead she's finding ways of tiring herself out. Look at him, how heedless and indulgent he is. He thinks he's so rich that he has no need to make merit? Oh, how very foolish he is.
Look at Utara. She's looking at me with a smile of contempt. It's as if she's scolding me with her eyes. It's sickening. I'm not putting up with this. You. You. Utara. Look at me. You want to fight? Well, you're going to get what you want. because you agreed to take over my place as wife temporarily, allowing me to fulfill my wish to make merit. No matter how you treat me, I will not become angry or vindictive. like a friend to whom I owe a debt of gratitude. I am not angry with her. Utara, I am a courtesan who you employed. I forgot myself and started imagining myself as your husband's wife, and so attacked you. But your heart is so noble. It is filled with loving kindness, and you have not shown me even the slightest amount of anger. I have wronged you. Please, forgive me. Oh, get up, Sirima. If you want to ask for forgiveness, then you should ask it from the Lord Buddha whom I revere above all others. Tomorrow, I will have completed 15 days of offerings. Please, come and offer food and listen to the Dhamma with me. A person should overcome anger with non-anger. Overcome evil with goodness. Overcome stinginess with generosity. Overcome careless speech with words of truth. Those engrossed in worldly enjoyments, indulging in sense pleasures, intoxicated by wealth, social standing, extravagance, praise, rank, prestige, and power, cannot see the noble beauty of truth. So young and beautiful, too young to die. The day this woman listened to a talk from the Buddha, she gave up her life as a courtesan and turned to making merit every day. But life is uncertain, and now, not much later on, she's dead. Uh, let's get down to work. It's already time to cremate the body. Hey, wait a minute. We can't cremate uh, her yet. Well, why not? The Buddha has requested King Bimbisara to order us to keep the body for three days. Uh, for three days. Oh, whatever for? When Sirima led her life as a courtesan, all the men in Rajjir were infatuated with her. Everyone wanted to sleep with her. Now she is dead. I would like to sell her to the highest price. I will start at the price she charged for her body during her lifetime. 
1,000 kahapanas. Who wants to start the bidding? Now, Sirima's been dead for three days. Her corpse is starting to decay. The fluids are flowing out of her body. The smell of the corpse fills the whole cemetery. Somebody would have to be crazy to buy exactly. the body. Hey, King Bimisar is reducing the price to 900 kahapanas. 800! Ha <laughs> ha! 800 kahapanas for a rock. Uh, 700! Corpse. Half the original price and still no one is making a move? 100 kahapanas. If nobody is going to buy this corpse, then I will give it away for free. of all conditions to arise, persist for a while, and then pass away. Investigate the impermanence of all conditioned phenomena. The tears of beings wandering through samsara are beyond measure. The bones which are laid down upon this earth cover it without gaps. This is something that is truly sobering to know. One who is still attached to forms, sounds, tastes, odors, and physical sensations cannot find liberation from this world. Sometime later, the Buddha went to stay in the Anupia Mango Grove, the place where he had stayed overnight when he first went forth. Five Sakayan princes, Prince Badia, Prince Anuradha, Prince Ananda, Prince Bagu, and Prince Kimbela, along with Kolyan Prince Devadatta, and a barber named Upali, approached the Buddha and asked for ordination. The Buddha ordained Upali the barber first, followed by each of the six princes respectively. Not long after their ordination, Venerables Upali, Badia, Anuruddha, Bagu, and Kimbila attained Arahanship. Venerable Ananda, receiving instruction from Venerable Punamantaniputta, attained the fruition of stream entry. Venerable Devadatta achieved only the mundane attainments of various psychic powers. Later, the Sangha requested of Venerable Ananda that he act as the Buddha's personal attendant. Venerable Ananda, the Sangha is in agreement that you would be suitable for the position of the Buddha's attendant. What are your feelings toward this. O oh Lord, 
lord and great teacher, I am ready to serve and attend to you. But please, may I make eight requests of you? Very good, Ananda. Make your requests. My eight requests are as follows. One, may Lord Buddha not give me good quality robe cloth. Two, may the Lord Buddha not give me good quality alms food. Three, may the Lord Buddha not have me stay in the same dwelling as himself. Four, may the Lord Buddha not have me accompany him on meal invitations. Five, may the Lord Buddha attend all invitations that I accept on his behalf. Six, when visitors come a long way to seek an invitation, may I have permission to take them to see the Buddha straight away. Seven, may I be granted permission to ask questions of the Lord Buddha whenever I am in doubt. Eight, on whatever occasion the Buddha gives a teaching of the Dharma, with myself not present, may he repeat it to me afterwards. Very good, Ananda. I consent to your requests. From the royal clan, why are the laity respectful and devoted to other monks, and not to me? Ah, Prince Ajatasatu, son of King Bimbisara of Rajagaha. He is still young, doesn't yet know right from wrong. I'll display my supernatural powers and gain the devotion of the young prince. Then whatever I may wish for, he'll find a way to get it for me. <laughs> Are you? What do you want with me? Don't harm me! Soldiers! Wait! Prince Ajatasatu, don't be frightened! Venerable sir! A venerable sir! How do you know me? Oh ho, Prince! Look at me! Sir. My name is Venerable Devadatta. I wish you no harm. I am here to help you. To help me? To help me with what? You will know when that time comes. Farewell for now. Just a moment. I displayed my supernatural powers and Prince Ajatasatu gained great faith in me. Now, whatever I may wish for, he gives to me. What a suitable leader I would be for the Sangha. now getting very old. It's time for you to lay your duties down. I request the burden of leading the Sangha. Please make the matter known to all the bhikkhus. From now on, I'll take over your teaching responsibilities. Uh. 
Absolutely not, Devata. But Lord! Lord! Buddha humiliated me in front of all the monks. Then he enacted the Pakasani Akama, preventing the other monks from speaking to me or meeting with me. From this point on, I'll set my mind on bringing him to destruction. <laughs> he can't do this. He can't do this to me. Your Royal Highness, please think it over. Even though you have now inherited the throne as you wished, you must still execute your royal father. Should he change his mind and wish to take his throne back, he would be sure to kill you. Therefore, you must act first without warning. That could be arranged. I'll keep him imprisoned until his life comes to an end. It's your decision, your royal highness. I tried to take his life three times, but in vain. It's time to try my last resort. I have to pretend to be strict in Dhamma Vinaya, so that all the bhikkhus will become my disciples. In order that the bhikkhus in the Buddha's dispensation may inspire greater faith of the lay people, may I request that the Buddha approve the following five rules to establish strict practice guidelines for all monks. Number one. A bhikkhu must live only in the forest, not in a town or village. Number two, a bhikkhu must live only on food given on alms round. Meal invitations are not to be accepted. Number three, a bhikkhu must wear only rag robes. He must not accept an offering of new robes. Number four, a bhikkhu must live only at the foot of a tree, not in a man-made construction. Number five, a bhikkhu must not eat any kind of meat. Should any bhikkhu break any of these rules, he must face punishment. What does the Lord think about these rules? Devata, I deny my permission. This Dhamma Vinaya is not slack in its rules. What you are asking for would create inconvenience for all bhikkhus in terms of maintaining their livelihood. Let all these observances be voluntary. As for the rule against eating meat, I allow meat which is pure in three aspects, not seen, heard or suspected to have been killed specifically for the sake of oneself. My bhikkhus, who do you think is superior? My rules are stricter, aren't they? Whoever agrees should come and live with me. Devata, don't do this. Breaking up the bhikkhu sangha is a very heavy, evil karma. From this day on, I am no longer your disciple. I'll be carrying out formal acts of the community only with my own monks. Whoever agrees, follow me.
Devadatta, can't you see that you're not a suitable leader for the Bhikkhu Sangha? Go, Kalika, what are you saying? <laughs> what am I saying? What am I saying? Just now, Buddha's left and right hand disciples, Venerables Mogalana and Sariputta, came to give teachings and instruction to your disciples. Having listened, almost all of your disciples followed the two Venerables back to Jetavana Monastery. Only a few of your most foolish and ignorant followers remain. Gokaliga? It's impossible! It's impossible! 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 Is that all the strict forest monk can say? Gokaliga? You! You! Hm. You are a fake. You are wearing the yellow robe only for the sake of gain and honor. You are boastful and conceited even to the point of competing with the Lord Buddha. I have no wish to stay with you any longer. Kogalika! Come back here now! Kogalika! I've been seriously ill with no improvement for a long time. It must be because of my offensive and injurious behavior towards the Buddha. But in return, the Buddha has nothing but loving kindness toward me, expressing not even the slightest ill will or resentment. Now coming to the end of my life, I'd like to seek out the Lord Buddha in order to ask for his forgiveness. Monks, be quick and take me to Jetavana Monastery. to Jetavana Monastery. Stop for a while so that I can bathe myself before entering into the presence of the Lord Buddha. in knowledge and conduct. Great one, teacher of gods and humans, I leave my chin bone as an offering to the Buddha, and I take the Lord Buddha as my refuge forever. I take the Lord Buddha 
as my refuge forever! Venerable David Arta has performed gravely serious evil karma. Even coming so close to Jetavana Monastery, he still was unable to catch a glimpse of the Lord Buddha. Oh, rather, he was swallowed up by the earth and sank down into hell. And I myself cooperated with him in committing a tremendous many evil deeds. I can't sleep at night. Dr. Shivaka, what should I do? Your humble servant thinks that your highness should go and approach the Lord Buddha in order to pay your respects and to ask for his forgiveness. You are right. Let us go together to pay our respects to the Buddha. I was duped into believing what Venerable Devadatta said. I thereby committed gravely serious wrong actions which affected the Buddha. I now realize my mistake. Please, may I beg your pardon. Please forgive me. I promise I will never do unwholesome deeds like that again. Your Majesty, it is a timeless law that in this world, hatred can only ever be appeased by non-hatred. One who associates with fools is doomed to sorrow for a long time. One who is perfect in morality shines like a bright flame. One with mindfulness is happy and grows in the Dhamma at every moment. If a king rules with Dhamma, all his citizens will be happy. Bhikkhus, all conditioned things are of the nature to arise, persist for a while, and then pass away. Therefore, we should consider such things as impermanent, uncertain, unreliable. The tears of beings who wander from birth to death on the wheel of samsara are countless. Their corpses pile up to cover every inch of the earth. It's such an enormous pity and worthy of sadness. Those who cling to attachment to the forms, sounds, smells, tastes and touches of this world have not the slightest chance of ever going beyond it. I declare myself as a Buddhist lay practitioner and take the triple gem as my refuge for the rest of my life. no alternative but to receive the heavy results of his terrible deed, murdering his own father. The perfect vision of the Dhamma, therefore, does not arise in him here.
changing sickness, death, greatness, striving, struggle, conceit, suffering. Your Majesty, the Lord Buddha has arrived at the Royal Palace. I think my life is ending. I can't bear this suffering very much longer. Oh, Father, please do not worry. All conditioned things arise according to their nature. Having come into being, they persist for a while. Having persisted, it is their nature to pass away. It is only suffering arising existing and ceasing, nothing other than suffering. There is no woman, no man, no us, no them. the last seven days, Lord Buddha, you have taught me the Dharma day and night. I have been liberated from the round of rebirth and attained to Nibbana. I have very little time remaining. I wish to express my veneration and then enter Nibbana for whatever faults I have committed through body, speech, or mind, please, through your great compassion, forgive me. Now, I ask your permission to take my final leave and let me pass into
ask for ordination from the Lord Buddha three times, but he has not yet given his permission. However, we won't give up our efforts. Let us shave our heads, put on the yellow robe, and follow the Lord Buddha wherever he goes. If women were allowed to ordain in the Buddha's dispensation, could they attain to the level of arahantship? Ananda, if women were ordained in the Buddha's dispensation, they could attain to arahantship exactly the same as men can. If that is the case, in your kindness, please give ordination to Queen Mahapachapati, who raised and looked after you when you were a child and thus fulfill her wishes, Lord. Ananda, if Pachapati will practice according to the eight strict conditions, I'll give her my permission. The eight strict conditions are 1. A bhikkhuni who has been ordained for even 100 years must bow to a bhikkhu ordained that very day. 2. A bhikkhuni may not spend the rains retreat in a monastery where there are no bhikkhus in residence. for the period of two rains retreats. Please, may the Buddha consider our ordination. I permit your ordination. After their ordination, Pajapati Bhikkhuni and the Sakayan Bhikkhunis practice mental cultivation with great determination until each of them had attained to arahanship. Now King Mahanama of the Sakyan clan has inherited the throne of Kapilawatu goes to show how unstable and impermanent even kingship is in this world. Prince Siddhartha, my husband, relinquished the royal throne without a second thought when he went forth. My relatives, my son, and even Queen Mahapajapati Gotami have followed after him and ordained. That being the case, it is best for me also to relinquish material comforts and ordain in the Buddha's Dhamma Vinaya. Princess Yasodhara and a great number of her ladies of the court traveled to Jetavana Monastery in Savatthi. After practicing the eight strict conditions for two rains retreats, Princess Yasodhara was ordained as a bhikkhuni. She practiced mental cultivation with great dedication and attained arahanship. Her ordained name was venerable Badakacha Nateri.
Having performed the twin marvel, the Buddha arose from his crystal seat and stepped forward with his right foot. He placed it on the summit of Mount Yugandhara. Then he stepped forward with his left foot, placing it on the summit of Mount Sumeru, upon which Tabatimza heaven is located. With his third step, the Buddha ascended into Tavatimsa heaven. He seated himself upon the Pandukambala stone, the seat of Lord Indra, the god of Tavatimsa heaven. His purpose was to teach the Dhamma to his mother in accordance with the tradition of past Buddhas. Delighted, Lord Indra and the host of Tavatimsa heaven gathered before the Buddha to hear his discourse. Tell me, have you seen my mother? O oh Lord, your mother was reborn, Santusita Devaputa, in the higher realm of Tusita. I will quickly go and invite your mother down. Mother, please come and sit close by. The kindness you showed me in your past life was great beyond measure. As an expression of my gratitude, may I take this opportunity of teaching you the Dhamma during the three-month range retreat here in Tavatimsa, so that you may attain the path, fruit, and nirvana. Mother, please listen. Ignorance and craving lead a person to rebirth. Agitated, their heart rushes around within samsara. For as long as the aggregates come into being, the supposition of a being is also there. In truth, such conditioned things are not worthy to be called a being. There is only suffering which arises, and suffering which decays and ceases. Aside from suffering, nothing arises. Aside from suffering, nothing ceases. Lord Buddha, you have ascended to Tavatimsa heaven and taught the Abhidhamma to your mother for the full three months duration of the range retreat. The people of the world are now wondering, when will you depart from heaven and descend to the human world? Moggallana, please let the people know that I will descend from heaven in seven days time arriving at the gates of the city of Sankasa.
This is the last day of the Rains Retreat. I will create three heavenly staircases for the Lord Buddha's descent from the heavenly world. The crystal staircase for the Lord Buddha is in the middle. The golden staircase on the right is for myself and the other deities. The silver staircase on the left is for Sahampati Brahma and his host of Brahmas. As he descended from heaven, the Buddha performed the marvel called Loka Vivarana, making the realms of heaven, earth and hell visible to all. Having revealed this amazing sight, he stepped down to earth at the gates of the city of Sankhasa. This renunciant has a very noble appearance. 
fitting to be a great man. Here in Kuru, it's very hard to find a husband suitable for my daughter, Bagandia. But today I found one. Venerable sir, my name is Magandia. I have a daughter who I would like to get married. But here in Kuru, I can find no suitable husband. And then I saw you today. I am very pleased by your appearance. Please, accept my daughter as your wife. Oh, and don't worry that she's ugly or unattractive. There's nobody in this whole country more beautiful than Magandia. Please, wait here. Oh, my, my dear child, Magandia. Oh, I'm exhausted. Hurry up, make yourself as attractive as you can. Now, right now. Quickly, my daughter. If you're tired, then sit down and take a rest, husband. And why do you want our daughter, Makandia, to dress up prettily? Come on, please. Sit down and rest? No. Makandia, are you ready yet? Hurry up. I'm ready, father. Right, right. Go quickly. I've met him. I've met him. <laughs> met who? I've met him. Hey, where's he gone? What's this all about? Oh, you brought me all this way and I still don't know what you're talking about. I've met our daughter's future husband. That's what I'm talking about. I told him to wait for me here, but he's disappeared. Ah, there, you see? His footprints are still there. You're knowledgeable in the texts dealing with the interpretation of footprints. Have a look at them. Hmm. Two footprints that exactly match in this way are the footprints of a great being. They show that he is beyond craving, beyond anger, beyond delusion, without defilement. Such a one is not interested in household life. <laughs> no defilement? What? Every man likes beautiful women. Let's see what happens when he sees our daughter. The main thing is to find where he's gone to. Over there! I found him! Quickly, wife! Magandia, hurry! Follow your father! Venerable sir! Venerable sir! Venerable sir, this is my wife. And this is my daughter, Magandia, who I'm going to offer to you. Brahmins, I rejected sensual pleasure on the day of my enlightenment. I've seen the root cause of your existence, karma. You arise from sensual thoughts. Those thoughts arise in me no longer. Your karma will appear no more. Brahmins, listen to this teaching. The wise person must put effort into raising his mind out of attachment to sensuality, freeing himself from Mara's snare, steadying himself with the hook of mindfulness. He is able to master himself. He is able to have victory over himself. Your teachings have illuminated the path ahead for us both.
Lord, do not hold it against our daughter. Magandia is still very young. We ask permission to go to my younger brother, to give him all my wealth, and ask him to take over as guardian of our daughter. As for my wife and me, we will ask permission to join the monastic order so that we may, in time, realize enlightenment. My name is Varanja Brahman. I am the ruler of this town of Varanja. Hearing of your reputation as a perfectly enlightened Buddha, I wish to have a Dhamma discussion with you. But why is it that when I, your senior in years, arrive here, you make no gesture of respect? Don't rise up to welcome me, and don't invite me to sit on the same level as you. Varanja Brahman. In this world, or in any other world, I have not yet met anyone superior in Dharma to me to whom I should make a gesture of respect, stand up to welcome, or offer my seat. It's my view that your way of practicing and conducting yourself is quite tasteless. Brahmin, my way is indeed tasteless. I have abandoned the taste of the sensual pleasures of form, taste, smell, sound, and bodily touch. But I am not tasteless in the way that you understand it. You have no assets. You teach non-action and praise annihilation. And furthermore, I would say that you are loathsome. Brahman, I have no assets or wealth because such things consist of Forms, tastes, smells, sounds, and touches. Venerable Brahman, I teach non-wrong action, non-evil action by body, speech, and mind. I praise the annihilation of lust, hatred, and delusion. Brahman, loathsome is bodily misconduct verbal misconduct, mental misconduct. I loathe all that is evil and unwholesome. But I am not at all loathsome in the way that you believe. You teach eradication, destruction. You teach non-arising and non-birth. Brahman, I teach the Dharma for the eradication of lust, hatred, and delusion and for the eradication of all unwholesome states. I teach the destruction of bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, and mental misconduct. Because these are things which are worthy of destruction, I have attained the state of non-arising and non-birth by abandoning the causes of birth and becoming. I speak only the truth in response to your comments. The truth is not as you understand it to be. Pay attention, Venerable Varanja Brahmin, and I will teach you the Dharma. Sending your mind outside and seeking faults in others is a cause for suffering. Reflecting internally, developing awareness of one's own mind is the path. Niroda, the end of suffering, is its fruit. The Dharma teaching you have given has illuminated the way for me. For the rest of my life, I take the Triple Gem as my refuge, and please may I invite you to spend the Rains Retreat here in order to teach the Dharma to the citizens of Varanja.
come out where I can see you right now. Otherwise... Otherwise, you'll do what? Who are you? Hmm. What are you doing here? I should be the one asking you the same question. I am the Lord of Monkeys, and I have been living in Rocky Tavana Forest for a long time. And you, what are you doing here? I am Paliliaka, the Lord of the Elephants. I got fed up with all the busyness and problems of my entourage and left to spend some time alone. <laughs> Yes, your entourage sounds just every bit as irritating as mine. You say you are the Lord of the Elephants, but then why are you wandering around spying on a human? This one is not like other human beings. He bears the marks of the great man. From the moment I saw his bearing and the graceful, peaceful way he moves, I felt full of faith and inspiration. Well, if that's the case, let's go and ask him some questions. Did you know that the Lord Buddha has left the Gositarama Monastery? Well, he has probably gone to give teachings in another city. Not at all. I have heard that one of the senior monk expert in the monastic discipline has had a falling out with a senior monk expert in Dhamma teaching over some small matter of the discipline. Not only that, but students of the two senior monks have sided with the teachers so that the quarrel has spread and now there is a major conflict. It got so bad that even when Lord Buddha himself admonished the monks and urged them to give up their conflict, they wouldn't listen. And so he left the monastery alone. That's terrible. Those monks are really stubborn and intractable. <sighs> How long will it be before we will be able to hear the teachings from the Lord Buddha again? That's the point. The monks dispute means that all the rest of us aren't able to listen to the Lord Buddha teach. The Lord Buddha must be fed up with the disobedient monk. From now on, we shouldn't make any more food offerings to them. Oh, good idea. Let's encourage all the other lay supporters to do the same. been coming back from alms round with empty bowls for many days now. Nobody in Kosambi is filling our bowls with any food offerings anymore. If this continues, how will we survive? What will we eat? The lay people are unhappy that we are continually arguing and in conflict, and that by ignoring the Lord Buddha's admonition, we made him leave. <sighs> And where has the Lord Buddha gone to reside now? Even though we've come to our senses, we have entered the rain's retreat period, and it's not possible to go off in search of him.
Venerable Ananda, I, Visaka, and my wife, along with all the wealthy families of Savati, have come to know that Lord Buddha is currently living alone in the forest. And so we wish to send an invitation to him, requesting that he graciously come to reside here in our city of Jetavana. The people of this city will offer food to the Lord every day in order that we may be able to listen to his teaching. Please, would you assist us in this? Do not worry, Ananta Pindaka. I will see to it myself. The rains retreat has ended now, so I will take 500 monks with me to Rocky Divana Forest to invite the Lord Buddha to come and reside here. You may put your minds at ease. Oh, it is our great good fortune to be able to pay respects to the Lord Buddha again and to listen to his teachings. Palilayaka, that is Venerable Ananda, my personal attendant, and those monks accompanying him are my disciples. Allow them to approach. Lord of Elephants, Lord of Monkeys, Allow me to kindly thank you for your service to me in looking after me in this forest. Now is the time for me to return to Jetta's Grove Monastery. Many tens of thousands of years more must pass before another such great being appears in the world. It has been our great fortune to have had the opportunity to serve the Lord at such close quarters. What a great shame 
maybe the Lord has to leave after such a short time. It will be very unlikely that we will have such an opportunity again. We will probably never see the Lord again. The Lord Buddha has forgiven us for our dispute. It was good that we saw our fault and swiftly made our way from Kosambi to pay our respects to the Lord Buddha in Jeddah's Grove. You're right. The Lord is going to give us a Dharma talk. Pay attention. Know this, monks. This flourishing or decline of this teaching is not dependent on the actions of outsiders, but depends upon the fourfold assembly of monks and nuns, laymen and laywomen. Consider the fool whose acts of body, speech, and mind cause harm to self and others. You have all entered the Sangha and have been training in the well-expounded teachings that I have given to you. Be diligent in your efforts so that you may realize the fruits of the training that you have not yet realized, that you have not as yet fully penetrated, so that you may become truly noble. In a short time, Angulimala will commit matricide. He will kill his own mother. This is a very heavy karma, which prevents one from attaining to the path, fruit, and nibbana. But this outlaw does not kill with malicious intent. He does so out of ignorance. This being the case, he should still be able to attain to the Dharma. I'll help him to escape from the deadly snare of his own foolish mistake. <laughs> I've already collected 999 human fingers. If I'll kill just one more person, I'll have the full 1,000 fingers, as instructed by my master. a recluse walking alone. He's about to meet his due. Exhaustion and still can't catch him. Oh. Oh. Stop there, Summoner! Summoner, stop there! I have stopped already. It is you who have not yet stopped. 
a holy man, should speak only the truth. But there you are, striding onwards, telling me you've stopped. Here I am standing still, and you tell me I haven't stopped? Ahimsaka, I have stopped. Stopped killing, stopped harming, stopped pursuing wrong livelihood, stopped all kinds of misconduct. It is you who have not yet stopped. Not stopped killing, not stopped harming, not stopped pursuing wrong livelihood, not given up misconduct. You're still grasping your sword. How can you say you've already stopped? The words you have spoken are immortal and true, but never before heard, even in my master's hermitage. Ahimsaka, all things which arise are of the nature to eventually cease. The sword which you were carrying has now been laid down. So let go of the mental defilement associated with your wrong actions. Should your heart dwell on those actions, it will soon become spoiled. Focus on recollecting your good action. Your heart will become increasingly cheerful and radiant. Be industrious in making merit, maintaining morality and brightening your mind in every single moment. From now on, I devote myself wholly to Buddhism. Please give me ordination in your excellent dispensation. I agree to give you ordination. Follow me back to Jetawana Monastery. God Baka has the wrong view. I will help him to see the truth of things. Bow, ah, uh, Lord Buddha, please sit down. Has the Lord Buddha some important reason for coming to see me? Or would this be more of a social call? Baka, I am aware of your thoughts and beliefs. Knows my thoughts and my beliefs? Well, never mind. I've never concealed them. They are the truth on heaven and in the human realm. Everything that exists in this universe is all fixed and eternal, all created by me. There is nothing on earth or in the sky, in the sun, in the moon, and the stars of which I do not have omniscient knowledge. Nothing is hidden from me. 
Baka, are you sure that you are the creator and master of all things? Are you sure that you alone know all things and that nothing is hidden from you? Absolutely. In that case, why don't you use your powers to create a magic body and hide in a place you believe nobody else can find? Then I will look for you. <laughs> yes, sure. I can do that. Try to find me if you can. Baka, you want to be a bird, do you? So you want to be a bee? Is that why you're buzzing around the flower pollen? to enjoy the happiness of the Brahma realm any longer? Is that why you have made yourself so fine and mixed yourself with the sand grains on the sea floor? that you are capable of finding me. But now it's your turn. If I can find you, then I will admit that you are the omniscient one. One more all-seeing than me. Whatever world system, whatever universe you've concealed yourself in, please show yourself. Baka, I did not conceal myself in any world system or universe. All the time that you were searching for me, I was walking up and down above your head.
Lord Buddha, I offer my obeisance. The powers that you have shown to me exceed those of all the deities and Brahma gods. Baka, pay close attention to this teaching. The power and pleasures in this Brahma realm are very long-lasting. They encourage you to think that all things are permanent. In fact, all phenomena have the nature to arise, persist for some time, and then pass away. All things exist in dependence on causes and conditions. All beings are born of their actions, heirs to their actions, are related to their actions, have actions as their refuge, are owners of their actions. Whatever actions are performed, good or bad, we must receive the results. Lord, I can see you are seriously ill. But although your pain is intense, your mindfulness remains firm, and your patience immense. You subdue your symptoms by practicing the four methods for success. I am so happy that you will live on for a long time as a refuge to your ordained and lay disciples. Ananda, I am now 80 years old and my body is decayed and deteriorating. It's like an old cart held together with bamboo. It can be used to carry a load for only a short while longer, but it's not a lasting solution. Only through concentration of mind can I hold this body upright and keep on walking. As for you, you must take refuge unto yourself. In the end, there can be no other refuge. Ananda, the precincts of Baliwea Chetia are peaceful and quiet. Should anyone develop the four methods for success and have the wish to extend his life for a very long period, he will surely succeed in what he wishes. The Lord Buddha has displayed the light omen to Venerable Ananda. In order that Venerable Ananda might invite him to extend his lifespan and continue teaching the Dharma for a longer time. Don't count on it. I must obstruct Venerable Ananda's heart and prevent him from understanding so that he will remain silent and appear indifferent to the light omen. <laughs> spoken to Venerable Ananda three times, and each time I've obstructed the message, leaving Venerable Ananda silent. <laughs> Ananda, go and find a peaceful place and develop your meditation.
remember? That after you had attained enlightenment, you said that for so long as the assembly of ordained and unordained Buddhist men and women had not yet become established in Dhamma, humans and gods had not yet attained to the path and fruit, and Buddhism had not yet spread widely in all directions, you would not yet pass into Paranibbana. Well, now all your goals have been achieved. You may as well pass away this very day. <laughs> Why trouble yourself further with benefiting sentient beings? Mara, no need to get heated up with worries and speculations. In three months' time, I will enter Purnibana. <laughs> Be sure then to keep your promise. <laughs> was the cause of that sudden unexpected earthquake? Please tell me. Ananda, there are eight possible causes for such an earthquake. One, movement of the winds. Two, a person with psychic powers. Three, the Bodhisatta departs from the heaven of Tusita and enters his mother's womb. Four, the Bodhisatta is born. Five, the Buddha becomes enlightened. 6. The Buddha gives the first teaching, setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. 7. The Lord Buddha lets go of the life principle. And 8. The Lord Buddha passes away. I have now let go of the life principle. In three months' time, I will enter Parinibbana. This is the cause for the earthquake which just occurred. Buddha, please live on to the end of this eon to teach the deities and humans. Lord Buddha, please live on to the end of this eon to teach the deities and humans. Ananda, why do you make this request of me three times? Oh Lord, you said that whoever develops the four methods for success should he decide to extend his life for a long period of time, he would be able to do so. That's why I have just now pleaded with you three times. Ananda, I have displayed the light omen, giving you the chance to invite me to extend my life 16 times already, 10 times in the city of Rachagaha, and 6 times in the city of Wesali. The 16th time was just now, in the precincts of Paola Chetia. After which, I let go of the life principle. Had you made your invitation on any of these occasions, I would have turned it down only twice, and accepted the third invitation. But now I have met with Mara, and resigned to dying. That which the Tathagata has let go of, has undone. 
abandon. It is not suitable to ask that he take up such a thing again. Ananda, all conditioned things have impermanence as their very nature. Having arisen, they must eventually cease. Complete cessation is the fulfillment of happiness. Nothing can be compared with it. person should lift his mind out of longing for sensual pleasures. Give up this snare of Mara, using mindfulness for restraint. A wise person is able to control himself, able to attain victory over himself. Lord Buddha, in addition to coming to stay in my mango grove, you have also given me a Dhamma discourse. You have shown such kindness to me, Junda, the goldsmith's son. Tomorrow morning, please accept my invitation to receive alms food at my house. This dish is called Sukaramatava. It is a fine and nutritious food. Please may the Lord accept it. Junta, this Sukaramatava is food that has been prepared especially for me and is suitable only for me. Apart from mine, no stomach could digest it. I give you the remaining portion to please bury in the ground. And for my monks and disciples, Please bring them food of another kind to eat. Yes, Lord. Ananda, my disease is now getting worse again. We must quickly travel to the town of Kusinara. It is there that I will pass into Parinibana. and rest under this tree. And please fetch me a little water to drink, will you? This river is drying up, and a caravan of carts has just crossed. The water is muddy and unsuitable for drinking. The river Kakuda is not far from here. Its water is clear and cool. Please, travel on a little. It's not very far. You can drink and bathe there. Even though I advise the Buddha that the water is muddy and murky, he still says he will drink it. Well, the Buddha must have his reasons. This is the first time the Buddha has stopped for a drink mid-journey. Previously, he has never requested water before reaching his destination. Oh, how 
How great is the Buddha's power? Lord Buddha, my name is Pukusa. I am a son of the king of the Mala dynasty and a disciple of the late Alara the Hermit. I am traveling from the city of Kusinara to Pava. What great fortune it is to meet you. I had made the determination in my heart that I may have the opportunity just once to hear the Buddha's teaching. Listen, Pukusa. This heart is luminous, but it is obscured by incoming defilements. The uninstructed worldling isn't aware of this truth, and so doesn't train his mind. But the well-instructed noble disciple is clearly aware of this truth, and so trains his mind. Pukusa, I know of nothing which can change as rapidly as the mind. You should therefore maintain your focus on the mind. Recollect the virtues of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Recollect your own well-practiced morality. And recall to mind those sacrifices that you have made for others. Reflect on the heavenly beings. Come to various happy states through cultivating generosity, morality, and mental development. When reflecting on these things, your heart will be free from lust, hatred, and delusion. You will therefore experience an understanding of Dharma and the delight that comes with understanding Dharma. The experience of delight gives rise to rapture. With the experience of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. The tranquility of the body gives rise to happiness. With happiness, the mind becomes firm and stable. This is called peace, non-suffering. The mind is ready to enter the stream of Dhamma. These two pieces of Singivana cloth are very valuable. The cloth is fine, delicately woven with a golden glow like the coals of a warm fire. May I offer these cloths to you as a gesture of worship? Please accept them, Lord Buddha. Pukusa, I would like to accept just one of your cloths. The other, please offer to Venerable Ananda, my attendant. Lord, these Singivana cloths are of great value. Please accept them both, and wear one as a lower robe, and one as an upper robe. Oh Lord, your complexion is splendid, clear and bright. What a wonderful sight. Ananda. The Buddha's complexion appears pure and bright on two occasions, one before the moment of enlightenment and the other before the moment of Parinibbana. We must quickly travel on to Kusinara. Unless I make the matter clear, people may think that his alms food was the cause for my passing away. Ananda, 
Alms food offered on two occasions is of special merit and will give great fruit. The honeyed milk rice offered by Sujata supported me at the time when I ended the mental defilements. The Sukara Madhava offered by Chunta will take me to the ending of the five aggregates, the last residue of conditioned thing. Should anyone blame Chunta, you should explain what I've told you. Should Chunta blame himself, you must ease his worry with these words of mine. The food which Junta offered to me was the final meal that sustained me. up from this place again. should practice according to the Dharma which is rightly taught by me. Such a person pays the highest homage. Ananda, I will pass into Paranibbana tonight. Lord Buddha, please don't pass away in a small town as Kusinara. Please travel on to a large city such as Sarati, Kosambi, or Baranasi. These cities have large numbers of noble, Brahmins, and householders who have great faith in you and the lessons you have given them. Ananda, do not fault Kusinara for being such a small town. In the past, it was a great capital city with tremendous wealth, abundant food, and many citizens. The sounds of singing and music were heard throughout the day and all night. Another thing, should I go to pass away elsewhere, Supada Paribajaka would not meet with me and therefore would miss the opportunity to attain enlightenment if I should attain to Parinibbana in another city. A great war would break out with squabbling over my bodily relics as the cause. Here in Kusinara lives Donna the Brahmin. He is capable of quelling such disputes. He will distribute the relics of my cremated body amongst the nobles who come here from many different cities. As a result, there will be no war. These are the reasons I have made the effort to reach Kusinara. In the past, great numbers of those with faith in the Dharma would travel from every direction to seek you out 
listen to your teachings, and ask you questions. But from now on, all those people and myself will be deprived of the opportunity to see you and to have an audience with you. Ananda, there are four places which are apt for recollection of me. One, Lumpany Park, where I was born. Two, Bodhagaya in the state of Magadha, where I was enlightened. Three, the Deer Park, Edisipatana, where I gave the first Dhamma teaching. And finally, the place of my Parinibbana Salavana Park in Kusinara, right here. Those who make pilgrimage to these four locations will experience disenchantment with the world and feel inspiration to follow in my footsteps. Lord Buddha, in this celibate life, one often encounters women. Some are mothers, sisters, and relatives of monks. Others are those with faith in the Triple Gem. How should a bhikkhu practice in relation to women? Ananda, a bhikkhu ought not to look at women at all. It is better this way. But if a bhikkhu must see women, how should he behave towards them? Ananda, if it's necessary to see women, they ought not to engage in conversation with them. It is better this way. If it is necessary to converse with women, how should a bhikkhu practice? In that case, a bhikkhu should have well-controlled mindfulness and sense restraint. He should have orderly speech and guard his mind from falling prey to lust or infatuation. The beautiful things of this world themselves are not sense desire, but the lust which arises in one's mind due to unwholesome intention, that is a person's sense desire. Once one has abandoned pleasure in unwholesome states, beautiful objects of this world still exist, but there is no way one can be harmed by them. Lord Buddha, after you have passed into Parinibbana, how should we treat your body? Use the method for treating the body of a wheel-turning monarch. Wrap the body in 500 layers of white cloth lined with cotton wool. Then place it in a coffin with perfumed oil. Then place the coffin on a pyre of sandalwood. Once the body has been cremated, enshrine the relics in a stupa, which is to be built at a crossroads so that people can pay their respects there for a long time to come. Subhata is intent on having audience with the Buddha. Now each of the Mala dynasty kings have just finished approaching the Blessed One, who is sick. If I allow any more guests, it'll be a great burden on him. Subhata, I can't permit you to see the Buddha. At this time, he is seriously ill and must rest. Ananda. Please allow Supata to come to me. At this time, there are six renowned schools of doctrine. Each has many followers. Of these six, can you tell me which are led by an Arahant? Supata, in any faith which does not have the Noble Eightfold Path, there is no true Samanas to be found there. Should bhikkhus or non-bhikkhus 
continue to practice the Noble Eightfold Path, this world will not lack for our hearts. Now listen to my teaching of the Dharma. This heart is luminous, shining like the moon, but it is subject to incoming defilements. As such, it is dulled and obscure, like the moon concealed by passing clouds. Lord Buddha, teacher of the most excellent Dharma, you make right that which I've wrongly seen for so very long. Please may I take ordination in the Buddha's dispensation? Ananda, please take on the task of ordaining Supata as a bhikkhu. Supata, consider the hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin, as well as all materiality and immateriality, according to the truth. Such things are changing, decaying, impermanent, suffering and not self, not a being, not a person, not I, not mine, not myself, not him. Not his, not himself. Supata, your supports for the holy life will be alms food, simple robes to cover yourself, the base of a tree for lodging, and fermented urine for medicine, following the ways of nature. Having received instruction from the Buddha, Subhada went off alone and practiced contemplation until attaining to Arahanship that very night. Venerable Subhada is considered to be the last disciple who attained to enlightenment while the Buddha was still alive. Loyal Bhikkhus, when I have passed away, the 84,000 teaching of Dhamma Vinaya will be your teacher. Don't think to yourselves, now that the Buddha has passed away, we'll have no teacher. Truly the Dhamma which I have taught and the Vinaya which I have laid down will be your teacher in place of me. You must take the Dhamma Vinaya as your refuge. Don't take anything else as your refuge. Even I, the Tathagata, am only the one who points the way. Nibbana. With all my effort attending to and following the Buddha, I have still not attained to our hardship as the other monks have. Venerable Ananda, I've been sent here to find you. The Buddha wants to see you. Ananda, come and sit close by. Ananda, don't be consumed by sorrow. It's natural for all conditioned things not to last. All that arises must decay, break apart, and pass away. You have traveled with and cared for me for a long time. Now you must make efforts towards your own liberation. In no long time, you will be fully enlightened.
Ananda, Chanabiku has views of self-importance because he's been close to me since the household life. He has become stubborn and difficult to teach. Once I have passed away, he will become even more stubborn and disrespectful, refusing to take instruction from any monk. You must give him the Brahma penalty. How do we impose the Brahma penalty? All the monks must refrain from speaking to, instructing, and admonishing Chana. Having received this punishment, Chana will realize his fault and change his ways. Finally, he will attain to our hardship. Loyal bhikkhus, for as long as the Sangha meets regularly together, in harmony, with respect for the disciplinary rules, and with humility towards the senior monks, careful not to fall under the influence of craving, content to live in the forest, and wishing happiness to all that come to live and practice. For as long as the Sangha is not preoccupied with work, not prone to indulging in talk, not given to excessive sleeping, not socializing without good cause, not given to indulging unwholesome desires, not falling under the power of evil intentions, not consorting with bad people, not giving up effort in practice, but striving for the attainment of higher dharmas. For so long there will be no decline for the Sangha, but only development and growth. Because I remind you that all conditioned things are of the nature to decline and cease. Free of heedlessness, develop yourselves and benefit others to the utmost. After the Lord Buddha's cremation ceremony was over, Dona the Brahmin was given the task of distributing the relics of the Buddha amongst the nobles and Brahmins who had gathered there. In each of the eight states represented, a stupa, or tediya, was built for enshrining the relics so that people could pay their respects to the remains of the Buddha. 1. King Ajatasattu of Magadha built a stupa in Rajagaha. 2. The Lihavis built a stupa in Vesali. 3. The Sakayan royalty built a stupa in Kapilavatu. 4. The Mauryan royalty 
built a stupa in the city of Alcapa. 5. The Kolean royalty built a stupa at Ramagama. 6. The Mala royalty built a stupa in the city of Pava. 7. The Mala royalty of Kusinara built a stupa in Kusinara. 8. The Brahmins of Vetadipa built a stupa in the city of Vetadipa. As for Dona Brahmin, he built a stupa at Kusinara for housing the golden urn, which had contained the relics of the Buddha before they were distributed. This reliquary is known as Tumba Stupa, or Tumba Jediya. Three months after the Buddha laid down the Khandhas and attained Parinibbana, Venerable Maha Kasapa led the Sangha in the first rehearsal of the Dhamma Vinaya at the cave of Satapana on Mount Vepara, outside of Rajagaha, with King Ajatasattu as the royal host. After the duration of seven months, the first rehearsal of the Dhamma Vinaya came to its conclusion. Oh, oh, oh.
Oh, oh, oh.